What's going on, y'all? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel. Time for another episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit. Today, by request of all the things, mm, I did that early. Whatever. A monk grappler with free archetype into wrestler for all the good grappler feats, as so they are. Built on the hunter automaton with arcane camouflage to play out like a grapply, stealthy, sneaky, literally built to do them. There are a lot of words there. All of those words translate out into super cool build. Remember, if you're liking what you're seeing, to like, subscribe, and ding the bell. Stay cut up on all your stuff. Remember, Patreon gets you access to a Google Sheet where this build is built out for you and a bunch of other cool things as well. For now, let's dive in. Okie dokie, so what you see is basically what's on the tin on this one. The goal of the build is to find a single target, restrict their action economy, debuff them, and then frankly make them dead. This build definitely also has options for doing things quietly, built in just kind of in-house, which will affect our archetype feat choices later on. Silent takedowns can be very, very effective, and the party that uses builds like this wisely uses their ally that's good at getting in, incapacitating, getting out again, is the party that can clear problems with way less literal problems for them to deal with. The request dictates we build on the Hunter Automaton, the Automaton built to look like a large pack animal, which will allow us to increase our speed to 30 feet when we're running on all fours because we will probably always have both of our hands free because we're playing a monk who wants to unarmed strike things. Not only does this ancestry lean into what the monk wants to do, be everyone's favorite lightning berserker, the automaton's boosts to strength with no flaws are very well kitted to be the guy who's running up and grappling people without having a debuff to something we need, like constitution to protect ourselves, dexterity to be stealthy, or mental ability scores to participate in other parts of the game. Monk is our class today for the background, choose anything that gives access to strength or dexterity boosts, and for our starting ability scores we're looking at a strength of 18, a dexterity of 16, a constitution of 12, an intelligence of 10, a wisdom of 10, and a charisma of 12. For the class feats, out the gate, wolf stance, very baked into what we want to do. The stance gives us wolf jaw unarmed attacks, which deal 1d8 points of piercing damage with the agile, backstabber, finesse, non-lethal, and unarmed traits. They also gain the trip trait should we happen to be flanking. Backstabber's the big one here though. When we hit a flat-footed creature, we deal an additional point of damage, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you can make this proc pretty reliably against flat-footed creatures, because, you know, you're grabbing them, that one damage over the course of a battle, to say nothing of over the course of the character's lifetime, definitely gonna add up. At level 2, we'll grab Crushing Grab. Whenever we successfully grapple a creature, we deal bludgeoning damage to that creature equal to our strength mod. This can be done non-lethally with no penalty, it's a little yes and when we're grappling things to also get a little bit of damage and to get them that much closer to on the ground. Alongside this, we will take the wrestler dedication for our free archetype again as per the request. This gets us expert in athletics, gets us titan wrestler which is huge because we'll need it to grapple huge things, didn't mean to make that joke. It removes the circumstance penalty for making lethal attacks with non-lethal things, and gives us a bonus to our fort DC when things try to grab and or eat us, and also gives us access to a lot of really cool stuff from across a lot of different classes which help what we're trying to do really shine. At level 4 we'll take Flurry of Maneuvers, which allows us to replace one or both of our attacks during Flurry of Blows with grapples, shoves, or trips, letting us two for one either two grab attempts should the first one fail, or a grab and then a strike because we grabbed them and now we'd like to start ticking up damage, or a grab which failed and then a strike because we'd rather go with the minus four from a agile wolf fang fist than flail at something and probably miss. We'll take this alongside combat grab, one of my favorite fighter feats, TBH. Make a melee strike while keeping one hand free, yeah we're pretty good at that. If the strike hits, you grab the target using your free hand, the creature remains grabbed until the end of your next turn or until it escapes. This has the press trait, so we will have had to have attacked at this point, but it essentially is an agile athletics to grab should we, for the first action of our turn, attempt to grapple, that fails, and then we go with this. At level 6, the secret spice of this build, I swear to god this is so dumb, whirling throw. 
for one action without the attack trait. If you have a creature grabbed or restrained, you propel them. You throw the creature any distance up to 10 feet plus 5 feet times your strength modifier. By the time we get this, our modifier is 4, so that's 30 feet. If you successfully throw the creature, it takes bludgeoning damage equal to your strength modifier plus 1d6 per 10 feet you threw it. So that's 3d6 plus 4 for one action, which is pretty good. To do this, you attempt an athletics check against the foe's fort DC. There are penalties for size category differences, of course, but bonuses if you, a large creature, because your friend enlarged, you were pucking the halflings. On a critical success, they land prone. On a success, you throw them as far as you wanted them to. A failure, nothing happens. A crit failure, nothing happens, and you lose your target. The secret sauce here, throw them straight up in the air. Why, my friend, you may ask? That's because fall damage stacking onto this lets this do even more. Some GMs are going to push back against this, but there's nothing saying you cannot do this. And this is like one of those corners of second edition, or here's a thing where you can actually do to shine really well and kind of squeeze around the tight mechanics of rules. By the time we get this, if we throw someone 30 feet in the air, then they fall, you take damage equal to half the fall distance, so staple 15 more damage on there. This probably is a finisher in and of itself, and again, at no map. So once they land, you could then just flurry of maneuvers to grab strike them again and this also doesn't have a once per turn rider so there's nothing saying you couldn't just make a very deadly juggle build gross we'll take this alongside snagging strike make an attack with one hand free if the strike hits the target is flat footed until the start of your next turn or until it's no longer within the reach of your hand to continue more buffs for yourself and everyone good old wolf fang fist comes next at level eight wolf drag for two actions, Wolfjaw gains Fatal D12. If the attack succeeds, you knock your target prone. This is your finisher. This is when you're done grappling, restraining, throwing people around, doing chip damage, and you just need to take somebody out. This will do it. Especially if they landed prone from a whirling throw and are on their like last legs, but they're flat-footed because they're down. Just punch them. Alongside it, strangle for one action versus a creature who is grabbed or restrained. Make an unarmed melee strike against a creature you have grabbed or restrained. On a success, you gain a circumstance bonus to damage equal to the number of weapon damage dice. Nice. And the target can barely speak until the start of your next turn or until it escapes. While it can barely speak, it cannot vocalize above a hoarse whisper. Must succeed at a DC 10 flat check or lose any action that requires speech, including like spells and things. But for someone who wants to sneak up under invisibility and grab someone, this is huge because, you know, you don't want people calling for help. At level 10, sleeper hold for one action, attempt an athletics check to grapple the creature involved, that creature being one you have grabbed or restrained. On a success, the target is clumsy one until the end of its next turn. On a crit success, the target falls unconscious for a minute, though it remains standing and doesn't drop what it holds. I'm pretty sure you can set them down if you want to, if they're down for a minute. Or, you know, just wolf fang fist them to death. Your call, Ace. I feel like a lot of times, this particular build is kitted to target not necessarily the boss monster, but the people outside the front door. Somebody's got to. The less hurdles everyone else in the party, particularly the less sneaky members of the party, have to get through, the easier things can be. So, you know, if you can drop up, grab somebody, sleep or hold them, seems really good to me. That alongside Aerial Pile Driver for two actions with the attack trait this time against a grabbed or restrained creature. Make an unarmed melee strike against a creature you have grabbed or restrained. The strike deals 1d6 additional damage per damage die, which is freaking huge. And on a success, they land prone. On a failure, you lose your grip on the target. On a crit fail, you fall prone and lose your grip on the target. But that's enormous. I'm presuming by level 10, we have our striking rune. 1d6 additional damage per damage die is an additional 2d6 damage stapled onto something and they go prone for debuffs. It's incredibly useful if for some reason you think you cannot yeet someone into the air, like maybe if they're too big or their 4 DC is just really, really high and you got lucky with that first grab. Or maybe you don't want people on the other side of the wall to see the guard ragdolling through the air screaming bloody murder. That's also valid. Stance Savant at level 12 when you roll initiative will let us drop into wolf style. Inescapable Grasp feels like very necessary tech for us. 
If a creature you have grabbed attempts to use a teleportation spell or effect, it has to DC 15 flat check or it loses the spell. If it tries to escape under freedom of movement, it has to succeed at a DC 15 flat check or be forced to escape normally. It's so good, I definitely feel like this is worth taking up a slot literally in your build because if someone has the out, then you've lost half of the things you have, which sucks. Gonna do some real weird shit for the rest of the build at level 12. At some point, we'll need to grab alchemical crafting, get trained in crafting itself, deception, and I'm presuming we were trained in stealth, we'll grab the assassin dedication. Since oftentimes we will be sitting in invisibility watching people, it seems very good and reasonable to jam a mark for death on that first person we want to jump. For three actions, that gives us a plus two circumstance bonus to perception checks to seek our mark and on deception checks to faint. Our agile and finesse weapons and unarmed attacks, our whole shtick, gains the backstabber, already had it, deadly d6 weapon traits whilst attacking will be replaced by fatal but we're not always swinging with wolf fang fists so the extra d6 feels good. Alongside this we will grab sneak attacker which at this point should give us a 1d6 sneak attack on top of the rest of the punching. Remember so often our target will be flat footed which means it's easier to crit which means that d6 will turn into more d6. It's real cool. Now at level 16 expert backstabber gives us two extra precision damage instead of one from our backstabbing wolf style. Eventually this will tick up to four extra precision damage from a plus three weapon. Surprise attack gives us the power of a thief rogue. On the first round of combat, if you rolled deception or stealth for initiative, creatures that haven't acted are flat footed to you. I think we're rolling stealth for initiative like 90% of the time. At least we want to anyway. Honestly, if we want to, it probably shakes out to 100% of the time. I digress. Diamond hands at level 18 gives our unarmed attacks the forceful trait, a circumstance bonus to damage equal to the number of weapon damage dice stacking for the amount of attacks we make if we ever just want to flurry them into the ground, alongside the classic assassinate for two actions versus a mark designated using mark for assassination who has not noticed us at all. Difficult to do with a melee attack, but definitely not impossible, you know, what with invisibility and such. Make a strike against the mark if it hits. Your mark takes 6d6 extra precision damage with a basic fort save against your class DC. If the mark crit fails, they die. This is an incapacitation effect, but you're hitting a flat-footed target and you're getting a boatload of extra damage, so even if this didn't outright kill them, it might kill them with damage, or at the very least, it's gonna sting real bad. At level 20, capstone for the monk, impossible technique. As a reaction, if an enemy's attack would hit you or you would fail a saving throw against an enemy's ability, either the enemy re-rolls the attack roll and uses the lower result, or you re-roll the save and take the higher. Alongside Clinch Strike, which feels 2000 and late, but here we are. As a reaction, when a creature you had grabbed or restrained successfully escapes, you get to punch them. For our ancestry feats out the gate, arcane communication is hilarious on this build. It gives you touch telepathy, which allows you to communicate silently and mentally with any creature you're touching as long as you share a language. You know, that person who you're trying to strangle outside the door, and I presume that means you're touching, you can communicate in their head. Keeping you quiet while you're keeping them quiet, the quieter we are the happier we'll be. Arcane Eye at level 5 gives you dark vision, absolutely necessary for anyone who wants to be the scout, which I think we do. Then Arcane Camouflage, another one per request of the build. This lets us cast Blur and Invisibility each once per day as second level Arcane Innate spells. Blur giving us concealment versus attacks, very huge should the assassination attempt to go south and we need to protect ourselves, invisibility being the thing that gets us up to our victim. Next we'll take Arcane Propulsion. For two actions, you get a fly speed equal to your speed for five minutes. We're a monk, we're damn fast. That's almost worth the enhancement. It's actually literally worth the enhancement, but Greater Augmentation, our final Ancestry feat, which we will choose to get Blur for 10 minutes and a 4th level Invisibility, letting us invisibly strangle things each twice per day. For our general feats, Toughness and Die Hard for lots of hit points and the ability to not collapse in a heap on the ground should things go south, Incredible Initiative to help us go first, Fleet to help us go faster, and Kenny Acumen for the thing that we do not choose along the path to perfection, our Fortitude save. For our magic items, the armbands of athleticism give us a plus two item bonus to athletics checks and give us a bonus to our climbing and swimming capabilities when rolling those. Eventually, this ticks up to plus three and ten from five. These will be necessary since we are not choosing a monk's stance with the grapple trait like, say, 
gorilla stance, for example, we're trading that out for a little bit of damage, knowing that this comes down the line, and when that happens, we get what we wanted anyway. The Titan's Grasp Apex item at the very end of the game gives us a plus three item bonus to athletics. It lets us deal extra bludgeoning damage equal to our strength modifier or 2d6 plus strength on a crit success when we grapple things that are larger than us, stacking real nicely with a lot of the things we do. Plus it gives us a sonic AoE, plus it gives us the ability to buff up our strength score. It's just a whole lot of win and we really like it. It will also be very helpful if we can get a friend to cast in large on us. Eventually at level 4 this will make us huge which will help us grapple up to the biggest things in the game. And if we have a friend who can cast divine or occult magic, silence once heightened to fourth level emanates in a 10 foot radius out from us for a minute which is huge if there are more than one bad person we need to strangle to death or we don't want them to call for reinforcements. Remember we have touch telepathy so this doesn't stop our ability to communicate with our party as long as we can reach them but it probably stops our victims from communicating with one another which is just so huge. The build is a lot of fun. I'm GMing for a kind of variation of this right now doing more barbarian things and it just it gets a lot of damage thrown all over the place there are a lot of debuffs that are associated with grabbing and knocking things prone which make it easier for everyone else to do damage and it helps protect the party because by grabbing on to someone you're almost always presenting yourself as a target you're stopping people from running away from you to chase down the mage and if they do you're really fast so you can catch up to them anyway and it has a lot of different modes depending on whether or not you want to just huck someone into the air, do a bunch of damage, grab them again, go for a big fatal finisher, or just one hit KO someone from jump. But that's all the time I have for this one. What do y'all think? Have we played anything like this before? How have your grapple builds gone in Pathfinder 2nd Edition? Let me know in the comments. For now, thank you all so much for watching. We'll see you next time.